All right, I think we're going to try to get started. There are a couple of seats still here in front if uh, we have anyone who'd like to come up front. Um, my name is Georgia Gates Durr. I'm president of the League of Women Voters of Alameda, and I welcome you here tonight. Um, we're thrilled to be having this forum, Bridging the Partisan Divide. I'm really thrilled. Family get-togethers have been very tough at my house. Uh, my older brother no longer puts me in a neck lock as a means of effective communication, and I no longer say, you're stupid. So, but the discussion has still been very, very heated. So we're thrilled to have you here with us this evening. Thrilled that our uh, Vice President, Michelle Elson, organized this for the League of Women Voters. And as always, I have to do a quick little plug about the League. Uh, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, political organization, and we, our membership is open to all, men and women. The League has been around for nearly 100 years, and our mission has always been to encourage active and informed citizen participation and to advocate for measures that help to protect our democracy. That's what it's all about. Our mission statement, or I should say, our quick motto, simple, empowering voters, defending democracy. If that sounds like something you might be interested in, we have a membership table in back. We'd love to have you join us. And if you're watching, you can go to our website, and that's lwvalameda.org, because there's strength in numbers, and we have a lot to be to get done, a lot to accomplish. So with no further ado, please welcome our moderator for this evening, Michelle Elson. Thanks a lot, Georgia. Uh, tonight, we're gonna talk about partisanship in America and what we can do to move past it. I am very excited to introduce our panelists who will be presenting to you tonight. Uh, first, we'll hear from USF Professor James L. Taylor. Um, who will provide background about partisanship in America. Next, Cal State East Bay professor Dr. Jean Lin will talk about the media's role in promoting partisanship. Um, following those two folks, Leslie Lepedo and Steve today of Better Angels will talk about the work they are doing to depolarize America. Uh, more information about all of our panelists is available on the bio sheet on your chair. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to outline our basic ground rules for tonight's forum, which are as follows. Uh, one, there will be no video or audio recordings during the event. The League is recording this event, and we will make it available on our website at lwvalameda.org. Tell your friends, anybody who's missed it who you think might be interested in this, let them know. Um, secondly, audience members are asked to refrain from shouting out questions or comments to individual speakers. And three is a corollary to number two. Uh, questions from the audience will be submitted in writing and may be restated by the moderator um, for clarity, basically. Um, cards are available if you wish to submit a question. And uh, these two uh, gals in the back, these young ladies, they've got the cards, they've got the pens. Uh, flag one of them down if you would like to ask ask a question, um, and we will do our best to get that answered in the time we have. Uh, but please do understand, uh, there's a lot of you who turned out tonight, which is great. Um, but uh, we may not, as a result, be able to get to all of your questions, uh, so get them in early. Um, with that, let's get started uh, with Professor Taylor. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited to be here tonight. Um, and I think I'll just go ahead and start. Uh, and want to show respect to my, my fellow panelists, uh, Jean and Leslie and Steve. And we're getting to know each other as we sit here. Um, but here's my solutions to party, partisan di division. I'm giving you my answers first, and then I'll complain about the problem. <laughs> uh, I think in California, there's a lot of innovations that are being attempted that are parts of a solution. And I hope you all address some of these. But the ranked choice voting system, um, the jungle primary, um, California moving its primary from March um, to, I mean from June up to March. Um, district elections like exist in San Francisco. And I really believe strongly in localism. I mean, I, I believe that Tip O'Neill was right when he said all politics is local. I believe, for example, that Martin Luther King's dream should have been limited to Atlanta and not to America. 
And I think that black power should have been limited to Oakland and not to America. And the one size fits all of I have a dream is why it actually, it was implemented almost nowhere. Um, and I think black power became um, this broad declaration for wide unanimity when everybody was different at the local level with all different kinds of local issues and, uh, and um, problems and challenges. So those are my solutions. Um, and, and on top of all of those, I would put love. Um, love, I think, is a solution. And I don't mean it in a romantic way. Um, but in terms of the partisan divide, um, it all depends on who you ask. Um, Morris P. Fiorina is a professor at Stanford who wrote a book called Culture Wars with a question mark. And the question mark implies uh, or implicates his uh, skepticism around whether there is such a thing as an actual cultural war in America or cultural division and polarization. He argues that if you look at a bell curve, that the divisions are at the extremities of the bell curve uh, here and not here where the rest of us are, but here. So the Re Democrats are here, the rest of us are here, the Republicans are here, the real divisions are with the partisan leaders. That's the partisan divide in America if you believe Morris P. Fiorina's research at Stanford. Then there was a journalistic account by a man named Bill Bishop. And Bill Bishop's book, has anybody read the book by Bill Bishop called The Big Sort, S-O-R-T, The Big Sort? He talks about, he's a journalist, and in 2004, in uh, Austin, Texas, uh, and somebody please let me know when I got like about four more minutes and then I'll, so I can wrap up. Uh, but in Austin, Texas, um, he was marveling at the question of, you know, he didn't understand how George Bush won re-election in 2004. He said because nobody he knew voted for him. <laughs> and from that, he took that there was this echo chamber effect in American politics in general, not just at the elite level, but that there was this echo chamber effect where Americans of like political orientations, regardless of race, gender, you know, et cetera, are only interacting with people of like political views and similarities. And I think the data shared here sort of bear this out in some of the, way, the ways in which this uh, polarization, if you believe it exists at all, might, might be hardening. Bill Bishop, in the big sort, um, sort of uh, puzzled around the question of um, how um, you know, Americans talk only to the, their own perspective and to their own views. And so we rarely talk to people across the ideological spectrum in American politics. We tend to think the worst of people who we disagree with politically. And that is something I think that is relatively um, intensified uh, in the last, I'd say, 15 to 25 years. It may even go back to 1964 um, with, the, with the creation of, I mean, with, the, uh, with Barry Goldwater and LBJ. Um, so it all depends on who you ask um, uh, and how they define polarization. Is it at the elite level? Is it at the mass level? And um, it, it all depends on these perspectives. But if you think about uh, sort of what Tim Russell had gifted us with or cursed us with, this whole notion of red state, blue state, there is something to that. And I try to clarify to people that there are no blue, there are no blue states in America. All the states are red. The only thing that makes any state blue is the non-white presence in a state. So California is red until you hit Los Angeles and San Francisco and Alameda County, and then all of a sudden, and maybe San Jose, and then it turns blue. Philadelphia, Pittsburgh turned the whole state of Pennsylvania blue. Uh, let's say um, somewhere like Ohio, Cleveland, uh, Columbus, and um, Cincinnati turn the whole state blue. And so those urban areas become very important. So we really don't have any red, uh, any blue states. The only blue state we would have in America is Hawaii and Washington, D.C., uh, if they ever uh, made Washington, D.C. Um, a state. So, so then, um, because we, we, we you know, I, I really do believe, though, that partisan division is our norm, inherited from the founding of the country. Moments of detente and breakthrough where it seems like there's 
people getting along. Like when LBJ comes into the White House, there was 90% approval of LBJ. And this is why he felt the courage to go ahead with the war on poverty and the great society. He had 80% approval from Republicans. LBJ did. And so um, this whole question of division in America is, is, is a real um, inheritance, I think, from the very founding of the country. The divisions are our norm. Martin Luther King is our breakthrough. The divisions are our norm. Barack Obama is the breakthrough. And this is pretty depressing. But this is the reality, unless we want to just, if you want me to say nice things that, that make you comfortable, then I will. <laughs> but if you want me to tell you know, what I understand the research to sort of hint, hint, indicate that our um, divisions were largely inherited from the founding, the American Revolution. If you look at the real reason of the American Revolution, you have to ask yourself, how did slavery survive the American Re Revolution? Why didn't it get, die with the American Revolution? Um, and, and it persists for 90 more years, and you end up with a second revolution called the American Civil War to, to address those unreconciled issues. And so the idea of uh, the divisions we see now in sort of urban versus suburban of, of US, that goes back to the 60s, right? With the creation of the suburbs, uh, Levittown, Pennsylvania, and Levittown, Long Island. I'm from Long Island, so I know all about Levittown. Uh, that's where Bill O'Reilly is from, and Sean Hannity, just in case you didn't know. <laughs> um, I know all about all of these politics that's going on in, in America because they're New York politics. All you are getting, like Ronald Reagan took the black politics of California from the black power era in the 1960s when those Panthers walked past him out there in Sacramento and shocked him. It, Ronald Reagan took the politics of, of Angela Davis, all of that, the Panthers, all of that, to Washington, D.C. Call it the war on drugs, et cetera. And I'm saying to you, Donald Trump is taking the racial politics of New York, Spike Lee, Rudy Giuliani, Ed Koch, Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, uh, Howard Beach, the movie Boogie Down, uh, the movie um, Do the Right Thing with Spike Lee, all of those tensions, Chuck uh, D and Public Enemy, all of those uh, you know, symbols of polarization are New York phenomena. And so what Donald Trump represents on a, on a national scale is simply what Reagan did out of California, took California politics to DC. Trump has taken New York politics to Washington DC and he acts just like a New Yorker acts in New York. And everybody else is like shocked and then those of us in New York are like what? Because it's pretty normal politics. So um, I think it's important to sort of appreciate that um, even in the state of California there's this ongoing tension around the state's unity. There's, there have been every election cycle, some millionaire who's bored decides he or she wants to split California up into pieces. Chop, right, Northern California, Jefferson, right? Central California with the water issues, and then Southern California. Nobody wants to be associated with LA. <laughs> Not even San Francisco. So, um, so my point to you is that we have national polarizations, we have what some scholars are identifying as coastal versus um, inland, thank you, coast, coastal versus inland divisions. And again, we have many different layers. Gender, sexuality, uh, race is the most powerful explanatory variable in all of party politics. Do not kid yourself. Nothing explains American party politics more than race, period. Not gender, not sexuality, not income, not region, race. The book, Carmines and Stimson, 1988 publication called Issue Evolution, and I'll shut up after this. They took the notions of Darwin in terms of the origin of species concept, and in their own, to their own satisfaction in terms of methodologically, they tie um, all of these competing social issues, race, gender, sexuality, education level, income, against each other in a kind of uh, origin of species, you know, chaos. And what they found, that e what emerges and continues, the issue that has evolved in American politics over all other issues, that does not mean that gender does not sometimes become more salient. It does not mean that sexuality sometimes does not become more salient. It doesn't even mean that, that the labor movement's issues may not become more salient. But in terms of the longevity and, and across time longitudinally, 
Race is the most powerful way of understanding American party politics. And the 1964 election was one of the major breakthrough clarifications of that with, with Goldwater and LBJ uh, on opposite sides of it. And this is where there's the major turnover in the party system in America, going back to FDR 30 years pre prior. And in fact, a good way of reading the great society is that it was the tail end of the New Deal. This is a 30 year cycle. And Arthur Schlesinger, some of you may remember him, in his book, The Cycles of American History, talks about these 30 year cycles. And at the end of the 30 year cycle, the generation, uh, the first 15 years, that generation that's arrived and come to its own, looks back at the past and repudiates it and challenges it, and then spends the next 15 years looking forward into the future, trying to set its own course. But the New Deal and Great Society tended to be a, a generational cycle. And then Ronald Reagan, who's a part of that dynamic, emerges in response to it. And Ronald Reagan, in the, emerging in 1980, ran in the 1970s against Ford. When Reagan emerges, Reagan completes what most party polit political, most scholars of party politics identify as an electoral <coughs> realignment. There are these things called realignments and dealignments. Realignments is, I, I would tell my students, realignments are when you, um, you, you, you uh, dealignments is when you break up with somebody. It's like, I'm done with you. That's dealignment, right? I'm not with your party anymore. Realignment is when you break up with somebody and like go date their best friend the next day. You know, it's like I'm I'm hooking up with somebody new uh, and I'm actually going to join another party. What we've seen across the board is a lot of um, dealignment. Uh, the New Deal coalition um, used to be blacks, Jews, labor, liberal Protestants, Catholics, women. Now you can add LGBT community to that to that dynamic. The Republicans tend to be uh, solidly conservative in different types of conservatism, economic, philo philosophical, on a continuum as well. But with the diversity of the New Deal, trying to reconcile the different issues and interests makes it much more difficult for the Democrats to stay united, and this is to the frustration of many Democrats. Um, but I think it's important to understand the question of polarization is a matter of perspective. Where does one stand and what are you looking at as a unit of analysis? What is the focus of your, of your, of your perspective? I would just, uh, the final thing I would say, we can think about the solid South idea, right? There was no such thing as a Republican in the South in this lifetime. In 1964 is when the, you first get Republicans in the South after George Wallace, all of that. And, and, and we end up with these divisions. So then you add in, in, 20, in 2008, a black man the first black president in American history. And it just conjures up all of these latent, inherited divisions. And then you get the most fierce reaction to it in the form of a backlash. Um, some scholars call it a front lash, but Martin Luther King called it the backlash. And I argue that if you look at the Reconstruction period, right after slavery, there's immediately a period of backlash called Southern Redemption. You move when you move forward to something like the breakthrough of Jack Johnson as the first black heavyweight championship, fierce riots, editorials in the LA Times telling blacks in America, nothing has changed by Jack Johnson becoming champion. More backlash. Jackie Robinson with baseball, more backlash. I argue that Ronald Reagan, and I'm done now, Ronald Reagan, <laughs> Ronald Reagan is the backlash to the civil rights movement. And that's how I understand Ronald Reagan. And make America great again, as, as much as people are trying to act like Donald Trump originated it, make America great again in its different form is Reaganite. Same words. It's Reagan's. So um, that's what we're really dealing with. Um, and the question is, how do, we, how do we reconcile it? And that's what my fellow panelists will do. <laughs> Thank you. All right, it's hard to follow that lively um, <laughs> talk. I've been teaching since 8 a.m. today, so if my voice cuts out for some reason, bear with me. Um, I have shifted my issue slightly. I was originally really wanting to talk about media polarization. Then I really thought about kind of the topic of this forum is like bridging the divide. And I kept thinking, I can't just come and talk about bridging the divide, but I don't offer like a how, right? So I really thought about it, and now I'm going to talk about 
kind of how to understand a political issue and how we should be talking about it, especially when you're trying to reach across the aisle to someone who has different political views as you. Like, how can we frame an issue to be more persuasive, right? And we're involved in every babe battles, online battles all the time. And these are, I feel like, useful tactics. I try this with my students. This is based on research that came out of Stanford, and that is still going on. So I, I hope to bring this to you, um, and then we can kind of better understand how we can talk about different political issues. And I think um, with Better Angels, they have like very concrete tactics of how you can do it as well. Um, I'll talk about the framing portion. <coughs> so framing, we talk about this this term a lot in, in the social sciences. It's really just simply put, how do you how do you talk about an issue to someone else that's not yourself, right? And if you can think about it, it's like a picture frame, and you're showing people this picture frame, and you want to you want them to see what's within that frame, right? And when you're talking to other people, you you don't talk about something that only you understand. You try to like reach out to see if they can connect with you through you telling a certain story, right? And it is really much about being persuasive. And we see this, this framing in everyday life, and you're basically just appealing to values of different audiences. You see this in when you're trying to sell a product to someone. You've all been to maybe a, like a car dealership, and if I'm trying to sell a car to you, if I see you're a family, and I might try to sell you an SUV or a van or a minivan, right? And I might tell you a story like, you can imagine your kids in the back rows. There's so much space for your kids, right? I'm appealing to family values that you might have to make, to make a sale to you, right? And making deals and businesses, you try to appeal to other people's values when you're forming your argument, right? So these are things that you do almost in everyday life. We see framing as examples also in the media, like media reporting. The way Fox News reports a protest is very different from how NBC reports a protest, right? In one instance, they might focus on rioting, on people breaking windows. In the, in the, in, on MSNBC, perhaps, it's more about, you know, like fighting for rights or a social justice angle, right? So um, we can see this on media, like they talk about an issue very differently, even though it's the exact same protest, right? <clears throat> Another thing, this is mostly what I study, is to give a support if you're a community organizer, a leader, or like you're trying to become one, if you're part of a movement, you want people to join your movement, get more support from people, mobilize people. You want to tell them a story that connects to them so they join you and they, they come and they fight with you, right? So with finding that message is really important for social movements and that they spend so much time getting the right frame to their message. Now, how do we do this in politics? All right, so um, this is based off of um, Rob Willer <coughs> and Feinberg's research. It started around 2015, it's still going on. So they did a series of experiments, and I'll take you through these experiments and maybe also ask for your ideas too. Um, and they want to kind of, like the topic of the forum today, like find out what each side is thinking. Because we kind of know, but we don't really, like if we knew, we would have fixed the problem already, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I think. But all right, they try, let, let's frame issues different ways, like political issues that might be important, like universal health care, like same-sex marriage, <clears throat> like um, for example, increased military spending. They're like, let's take a bunch of political issues and let's frame it differently and see what appeals to either side. All right, and so their main topic for this first part of the experiment was to say, let's convince people that have opposite political views as you to support an issue you believe in. All right, all right. So the task for people that identified as more liberal was, let's have you write a paragraph to convince conservatives to support same-sex marriage. <laughs> all right. And for conservatives, people that identify as conservative, obviously these are not people who are absolute Republicans or absolute Democrats. They're just people that identified as kind of being on one side. They said, all right, conservatives, now convince liberals to support making English the official language. <laughs> now, like, well, this is all debatable, but they, they tend to be um, arguments or issues that one side cares about more than the other. All right, <laughs> so they started out that, with this. Can I have perhaps one or two volunteers um, to have, give me one or two sentences about how you would try to persuade the other side on either same-sex marriage or, how to, or that we should make English an official language? What argument would you use, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Same-sex marriage builds family stability in mm -hmm. the community. Yeah. Builds family stability, that's really good. 
family stability as an argument to try to appeal to conservatives. Anyone else? Maybe one more? How would you try to tell a conservative friend to support same-sex marriage? Anyone else? Economic advantage. Economic advantage. Well, this, you guys are very, very advanced, persuasive people. <laughs> because I'm going to show you what others, like what, what yielded and what, what the results of the experiment was. All right, we have family stability. We have economic incentive, uh, economic advantages. Okay? All right. So initially, before they started this, they just sent out a bunch of requests for people, a group of liberals, a group of conservatives, and they were like, write passages, little paragraphs about these issues. And then they ran all these issues through the computer and identified what those key themes and key values were for conservatives and liberals. People who were conservative and had conservative values tend to use arguments that include loyalty, authority, and patriotism. Okay, That was kind of their finding from all those passages they ran through a computer. <coughs> now for liberal values, people who are liberal, they tend to write with a kind of a hint of fairness of equality to their arguments, okay? So that was kind of the, the background of this. So conservative values, they call it moral values, associated with these three things, liberal values associated with these two ideas, okay? All right, so this, let me give you an example. Conservatives persuade rivals on English as official language, all right? These are actual passages that people wrote. All right, every country needs to be unified. Making English the official language will help unify the country as we can all communicate with each other and speak the same national language. You can kind of see the unity, right, in one country, right? This fits with conservative morality, conservative values. So this is an example of what conservatives write that reflect conservative values. Now, of course, some conservatives also can use an equality argument. For example, they would say, by making English our official language, there would be less racism and discrimination upon the very groups that are being persecuted. Now, sometimes it fit with liberal morality. But guess which passage most conservatives wrote? Guess what, which passage, the first one or the second one, tend, tended to be what conservatives would produce as a passage? You think, it was a, you think it's the second one? <laughs> first one. They stuck with their values. Unity, country, you know, it's about being together as a country. All right, the, on the other end, now liberals persuade rivals on same-sex marriage, right? Now we have, why would we punish these people for being born a certain way? They deserve the same equal rights as other Americans, right? You see the equality and fairness values? That's what fit with the liberal value, right? And now we have the other side, or the other uh, appealing to conservative values, our fellow citizens of the USA um, deserve to stand alongside us, deserve to be able to make the same choices. Our goal as Americans should be to strive for that ideal. We should lift our fellow citizens up, not bring them down. Again, unity, kind of, as an American, we should do this and that, right? Fitty with conservative values. Now, which one, which passage, the first one or the second one, do most liberals write about? Or do the most, first one? Yes. So what does this tell us? Conservatives and, conservatives and liberals both kind of tend to stick to their own moral arguments, and they don't really consider the other side. Even when they're being told, write a passage to convince your rivals. They still write, well, we still write, according very much to what we believe in, right? And, and you guys actually provided very good arguments, actually not sticking to this uh, this kind of finding of the experiment. You were able to appeal to kind of the economic incentive um, and family stability, um, which is family values is a very kind of conservative um, ideal that they talk about a lot. So, but the study found that there's some struggles when you're trying to use values, others, the values of the other side to convince others, right? And then they, they then, asked these people when they read each other's passages, did it convince you to change your stance? And it was ineffective, right? Obviously. <clears throat> now I can give you some stats behind this. Liberals that wrote about same-sex marriage issues, only 9% even tried to appeal to conservative values using words like values like loyalty, patriotism. 69% stuck to liberal values, their own, right? Equality, fairness, everyone should be equal. Mm. Now the other side, 
conservative, conservatives that wrote about making English the official language, only 8% appealed to liberal values. 59% stuck to their own like one country patriotism type of thing. Okay, so that's surprising. I mean, we sit here and we think, obviously, well, when we try to persuade, persuade others to buy something, we would appeal to their values. But when it comes to politics, somehow we forget about that. So then we, uh, the, so then the study we're gonna see here, they reframed these passages, then did a separate study. Now, the study was reframed, then they passed out these new paragraphs to new sets of people, and then they followed up with a survey to show if people showed support for that passage. Okay. And remember, purity, loyalty, authority is conservative, fairness is liberal. So let's let's look at a couple of passages real quick. How much time do I have? Sorry. Okay. Okay. Well, take two. All right. This is the new reframe same-sex marriage issues. Obviously, reframe for the conservative side. Okay. I know it's a long, it's a heavy text, but I bolded the parts. All right. <coughs> Although gay couples in America have different sexual preferences, they're still proud Americans like you and me. They share the same basic hopes and desires in life. They share in the American dream to have a family, a home, etc. Like other proud Americans, gay couples peacefully build lives together, buy homes, and contribute to the American economy and society. Then there's a paragraph about how they make up a large portion of our nation's military, right? They fight for freedom and defend what Americans hold most dear. Right, and then last paragraph they hit home with, they are proud and patriotic Americans, okay? So that's the way it was reframed, and this was given to a bunch of conservatives, right? And actually, conservatives and liberals. Let's look at what happened. Liberals that were given that passage we just read supported same-sex marriage no matter if they read that patriotic message one or an original like equal rights thing. They, they still supported same-sex marriage, period. Now, conservatives, if they read this patri patriotism message, significantly they were more likely to support same-sex marriage after they read that passage the way it was written, okay? All right, let's go to the, the flip side. Now, this is trying to convince the other side, reframed military spending issue. All right, this is talking about military spending as fairness, as equality, right? All right, military provides a fair chance for minorities and the poor, the passage says. They say things like, not everyone's born into equal socioeconomic conditions. Um, this would help level the playing field. Everybody would then have an equal opportunity. Um, then there wouldn't be concern for race, socioeconomic status, religion, um, break free of the bonds of inequality, right? Fairness message is a kind of more liberal values embracing that. <coughs> Guess what the findings were? Conservatives, regardless of whether it was written like that, still wanted increases in military spending. No surprise there, right? But liberals then, if they read this fairness frame, showed more support for military spending if they read this, all right? And this experiment, although hypothetical, actually had real life consequences. And um, Rob Willer, when he was doing this study, worked with a political polling firm, and they did this um, kind of a reframing of a universal health care thing in Ohio in a district where Hillary was at the time polling very low. And after they spread these new messages that ref were reframed with more conservative values about health care, um, they received higher support after that. So I can't tell you where or which organization, but it has some real life consequences when you think about appealing to the, the values of the other side. <clears throat> and just in summary, Issue framing is really important. Those are kind of the values that they found from the passages, but they're very general themes. So it's like purity, loyalty, authority, um, and fairness on the other side. Um, but also, I'm a sociologist, so I always like tell my students things like, you should just talk to everyone, right? Like the more you talk to people, the more you understand what their values are, and the more you're able to also appeal to your values based on that understanding. And I think Better Angels has like really good methods of how you can do that. Right. Thank you. Just a reminder, everybody, if you've got any uh, questions for our awesome panelists, uh, we do have folks with cards and pens who are happy to take your questions. Um, I think we got one in the back here. If you want to go, um, and just a reminder, all the questions and comments are in writing. 
So they're in writing? The mic. Okay. Can everybody please hold the mic? <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure. We want to hear the content, not the class. Okay. Um, so anyway, questions? You can get those done. And we're going to move on to the folks from Better Angels. Okay. <laughs> and bathrooms are through Where's the other? <clears throat> so um, let's see. Is this sound okay? Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Great. Um, okay. Um, I just want to say hi to everybody. Um, I'm Leslie Lopato. I'm the blue co-chair of the San Francisco Better Angels Alliance. This is my buddy Steve Today, who is a red member of the Alliance and also a workshop organizer. Um, I wanted to thank the League for inviting us to participate in this really remarkable program. Um, we are going to be the non-academic portion of the program. Um, and I'm going to start out with a couple of questions. The first one is, by a show of hands, how many people have lost a friend because of a political disagreement? No, Sierra, you all have some really, yeah, a few people have. How many people have felt anxious facing a holiday dinner with family who they disagree with politically? <laughs> a lot more people. <laughs> um, how many of you feel that they can't talk about politics at all with certain friends and family? A lot of people, okay. So, um, a discouraging number of Americans would answer yes to all three of those questions. Better Angels is a citizens movement that is attempting to find a way to allow people to have political conversations that are civil and productive and to decrease this kind of paralyzing polarization that we seem to be stuck in today. Um, I know that sounds like a real pie-in-the-sky idea in this climate, but in fact, it's exactly what we have seen happen when people are willing to try this. So what is Better Angels? Better Angels is a movement that was started a nonprofit organization. It was started shortly after the 2016 election by a small group of liberal and conservative citizens who were um, very alarmed by the venomous, uh, rancorous, bitter nature of the political dialogue in the public space in America. And um, they, they were hearing things like people on the other side are evil, they are stupid, they are deplorable, <laughs> they are dangerous, they are just plain bad, they are inhumane. So the idea was to have um, shared leadership of an organization between blues and reds, at, and, and we use those words just as a shorthand, blues being liberals, reds being conservatives. Um, to have shared leadership between blues and reds at all levels of the organization, and that was kind of unusual in those days, and it's actually still kind of unusual because most organizations are either all red or all blue. Mm -hmm. um, the goal was to depolarize America, a small goal, <laughs> Not very. Um, and to get people to recognize and respect the humanity of their political opponents and to find a way out of the echo chamber. They chose the name Better Angels from a speech given, the first inaugural speech given by Abraham Lincoln in 1861, and you'll see the quote up there. Um, Lincoln in his speech affirmed his faith that the bonds between all Americans were actually unbreakable and would eventually be resolved. Um, so we have the Better Angels Pledge, although I confess that that <coughs> word always makes me think of the Girl Scouts and the Pledge of Allegiance, but it gives you an idea of what we think needs to happen. As individuals, we try to understand the other side's point of view even if we don't agree with it. In our communities, we engage those we disagree with, looking for common ground and ways to work together. In politics, we support principles that bring us together rather than divide us. So what do we actually do? Well, we run workshops. There are two types of workshops we do. Red-blue workshops are half or full day, very intense, structured conversations that are moderated between equal groups of reds and blues. Um, skills workshops are open to people 
of any political color in um, any number. Um, and it's an effort to teach communication skills and strategies in having political conversations that are not antagonistic and that really allow people to hear what the other person is saying and to express their own point of view in a non-antagonistic way. We also do Better Angels format debates which, in which each side presents uh, their views on a particular issue with the goal of also listening to and hearing what the other side says and without the goal being to make points or to score the win in the debate. Uh, and the debates are carried out with genuine respect from each side for the other side. The other thing that we do is we form Better Angels Alliances. And those are formed when a group of people who go through a workshop feel that they would like to continue the conversation and they'd like to continue the work of the, the workshop after they're done in their local community. The eventual goal of alliances is to provide a forum for Reds and Blues to find common ground and common goals on specific community issues and to look for issues in which they feel they can together support some kind of political, political activity. What don't we do? We don't try to get the other person to give up his or her political beliefs or perspective. And we don't try to push people to compromise or to meet in the middle. So it's, it's very different from what Dr. Lin was talking about. Um, what is depolarization? Well, I won't go over this whole slide, but you can see starting from the most depolarized on the left side of the arc, where the, the words used are things like hatred, enemies, harming the country, deplorable, you gradually move across the arc to the other side where you have some basic respect for your political opponents. You have some sense that they have valid points and that they have something to contribute, even though you disagree with a lot of what they say. And that you feel that their perspective is important and that including or paying attention to their perspective is important. So what can you do? Well, <laughs> you can join Better Angels. It's only $10 for a year. And with that $10, you get access to a lot of resources on the Better Angels website. Um, you can participate in monthly informative membership calls. Um, you can also, even if you are not a member, participate in a workshop. And we'll give you some information about our upcoming workshop. And you can volunteer to be trained as a moderator or to become an organizer of workshops yourself in your local community. So I'm gonna ask Steve to take a couple of minutes to tell you about his personal experience as a Better Angels member and um, as a workshop organizer. Terrific, thank you. First, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what... I'm talking too loud. <laughs> I do that anyway. Uh, but I was brought to Better Angels uh, because of my experiences with Toastmasters. I joined, joined Toastmasters about 10 years ago. It was to improve my skills as a sales and marketing person. I thought everybody in Toastmasters did, was in that situation. When I got there, I found out there was that group of people trying to get better with job interviews and things like that. But then I found that there were a lot of people that were new Americans where English was their second language and they were trying to improve their English skills. And if you go to any given Toastmasters meeting, there's probably 15 people in the room, male, female, young and old, every ethnic group you can imagine, every religion you can imagine. And on any given night, an immigrant could be giving a speech that is evaluated by another immigrant where both of them are from countries that may be at war right now. But they have the common goal to help each other improve their skills. And I just learned a tremendous amount going through my Toastmasters journey. And during the 2016 election, 
I started talking to the group about that. And we have over 3,000 members in our district in part of Northern California. And I got some positive feedback, and then I started talking with people individually. And what I found is it's really difficult to either buttonhole or position somebody with a whole set of views from one political perspective. And what I mean by that is there's a liberal platform and there's a conservative platform, but a lot of times we'll stereotype people. We'll talk with somebody and they'll, we find out they believe a certain way on taxes, so by definition they believe a certain way on immigration. Or they believe a certain way on abortion, and by definition they believe a certain way on uh, climate change. So I didn't know where to go with it, and then I found out there was a great article last June in USA Today about Better Angels. And I said, that's it. And what we do is we just have conversations and we find out the nuances. And, you know, in Alameda, you know, this, this event has been planned for a long time and we didn't know there was going to be a government shutdown. But the liberals in, Calif in Alameda and the conservatives in Alameda, I would bet, are on the absolute same page and have a lot of common ground right now with what's going on with the Coast Guard. Yeah. Because we're a Coast Guard town and our neighbors aren't being paid. So if you're talking to somebody you completely disagree with on taxes, you're probably going to have a lot of common ground with making sure you know the families are okay <coughs> on that situation. So that's one thing that's going on right now, but there's a lot of other areas I'm going to introduce a film that shows a workshop that was done in Ohio, and it's called Finding Common Ground in Ohio, and Leslie's going to put that on right now. You got it? Uh, this part of Ohio um, is southwestern Ohio, and it's in between the uh, metro area of Cincinnati and Dayton. So there's a lot of rural and suburban areas, um, depending on what part of the county you're in. Factories have been closing down left and right. So I've seen a lot of forced um, retirements, a lot of forced layoffs. Uh, once it, some people get through the layoffs, uh, sometimes they are able to come back. Some, a lot of times they weren't. I've had the door slammed in my face. I've had people say very rude things about Obama and ask if I voted for him. Mm -hmm. And some people would say, hey, you're not gonna lie to me, go ahead and put your sign in the yard. And other people would say, get out of here because you're a Democrat. I love Don Trump, and a lot of people don't. And I think it's not his personality. He's a man that has given his life for his country, if you think about it, and that's why I love him. But the, the biggest challenge is getting that sort of a message across of who he really is. In my opinion, if you voted for Trump, then you're taking on all of the things that he and his supporters are for, um, and I think you're racist, and I don't wanna be involved in that. Sometimes to speak to a, uh, an atheist or a, um, a person that's not conservative, have the same beliefs as me, uh, a, person, a, a person of a different color, um, it's, Sometimes I want to talk to them, but I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you, right now I'm, I kind of feel afraid to, to, to open my mouth. I am afraid that if this vitriol and, and this animosity continues to grow, it, it, it might give certain groups a, a blanket check to, to, touch, to touch upon violence. There are nice people, people who do nice things, and I don't know how we get back to that. What you just saw were excerpts from interviews done prior to a three-day gathering of seven Republicans and eight Democrats in the small Rust Belt town of Lebanon, Ohio. Their comments revealed their anxieties and concerns about their coming meeting with folks who voted differently from them. After two and a half days of skillfully guided and very dynamic exchanges, a group statement was read by David Blankenhorn, one of the leaders of the gathering, that summarized what had taken place. We are 15 residents of Southwest Ohio. Politically, 
Seven of us are conservative in our philosophy, typically voting for Republican over Democratic candidates and supportive of President Donald Trump and his administration, while eight of us are liberal in our philosophy, typically voting for Democratic over Republican candidates and critical of President Trump and his administration. A number of us on both sides began our meeting believing that the other side could not be dealt with on the basis of rational thought. We say unanimously that our experience of talking with rather than simply at or about each other caused us to abandon that belief. After the meeting was over, this is what the participants had to say about what they experienced. The way this weekend affected me is I showed emotions I kept hidden for a long time. This is the first time I've cried in a couple of years, actually. Um, so it brought some emotions out of me that I was afraid to show. I did end up liking them as people, and even the one that came in and was saying he's arch conservative and, and Trump is his guy, we, we joked, and it was a genuine laugh that, that we had with each other. So I think talking really can, is not underrated. If more people will have this experience, I think maybe our country could come back together and pull together as one and learn to share and understand it's okay to have opposing ideas. It's okay to be different. We are still human. We still love one another. It smashes a lot of the stereotype of what one group or another group is supposed to be. And I have permission to call him my Muslim friend, okay? <laughs> we are a friend. So anyway, we have, we're going to lay the groundwork, he and I, and we're going to lay the groundwork. And one thing that we're going to do uh, representing what we just came from uh, is he's going to attend a church with me, a Christian <coughs> church, and I'm going to go visit. I'm going to go visit a mosque with him, and we're going to see what each other are doing. Nice, nice. We talked to people this weekend. I was very, very impressed with the dynamics of that. And if you did 20,000 of these across the nation, you would change the world. I truly believe that because people are talking to people. America has been around for a couple hundred years or so, even more. And these challenges at some form always existed. And American people have always been able to solve these problems. And I mean, this is not we are going into an uncharted territory. This is not our first presidential election. This is not our first uh, controversial campaign. This thing should go on and on and on. Uh, this, this, what we just did this weekend, should not stop. This should go on to the next county, to the next state, to the city, and, and back out into the country and down the, every highway. So I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, yes. I'm going to give you. I just want people to know that the um, the conservative Christian and his Muslim friend actually ended up doing a road trip together to the better the first Better Angels uh, National Convention, which was I think in Virginia or West Virginia, I forget, and had a wonderful time there together. So thanks everybody for watching the video. We are very active. Uh, Leslie and I and Joe, Joe Lepore on the back, uh, the three of us are part of the San Francisco Alliance. Uh, Joe, Leslie, and I did a workshop at the end of September at Joe's office where we got six liberals together and uh, six conservatives, and they just had a conversation. We didn't do the three-day, we did a, th uh, a three-hour. Uh, we have three-hour presentations, eight-hour presentations, and then weekend ones. Uh, we're planning another one on February 9th in San Francisco. Uh, we're actually looking for some red participants. So we've got, it, it, you know, we are in the Bay Area, so we've got enough blues. Uh, but one of the things Leslie said that we tell every participant, if you walk in the door a progressive, you're gonna leave a progressive. If you walk in the door a conservative, you're gonna leave a conservative. You're just going to learn about the other side. You're gonna learn a little bit about what they feel the stereotypes are and things like that. 
but nobody's going to try to change anybody's mind. So uh, if anybody would like more information, um, I've got my email address on some cards. Uh, you can either take a card or take a picture of it. We also have a website. Oh, and there's a sign-in sheet too we have, and that's a really good one so we can get information to you. Uh, we also have a great website, better-angels.org, and put the dash in there, because if you just do betterangels.org, it, it'll take you somewhere else. <laughs> so better-angels.org, uh, and then we're always trying to build relationships with uh, other people that would like to depolarize America and help people find common ground. So if you belong to any organization where you know you'd be willing to have us come in and introduce ourselves we'd be glad to do it and if you have a company or an organization that would like to sponsor one of our workshops they're not huge at, you know they're not big productions but usually what we do is we make copies we make coffee uh, maybe bring in bagels and things like that so every once in a while a company will sponsor one of our uh, workshops but uh, I'd love to keep in touch with all of you I've lived in Alameda all my life I still do I live on Bay Farm Island so uh, you know we can exchange emails talk on the phone or uh, have coffee and then on Thursday night on the 31st at Joe's office which is the Remax tribute office on 2437 Santa Clara we're going to have a viewing party the, the leadership from the Better Angels organization is going to have our own State of the Union address. <laughs> now, <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we, we planned it for two days after the official one, which, you know, Lord knows what's going to happen. But what we predicted was that would be more of a State of the Disunion address because the president would talk about why his ideas are better than the Democrats, and then there'd be a Democratic response, and they'd talk about why their ideas are better than President Trump, and it would just be, you know, uh, the same old. And we are going to do a State of the Union address, and we're going to talk about what unites us through do, doing the hundreds and hundreds of workshops we've done over the past year, what we have found Americans have in common. So, that will be live streamed. I've got a press release that shows you how to get on it. And then if you put your name on the sign-in sheet, Better Angels is going to get a message out tomorrow about some logistics. And I can give that to you too. But if you want to come to the reviewing party at Joe's office, there's going to be pizza and light iced tea and water and things like that. We'd love to see you. So that's what I have. And uh, Leslie has one more thing. Just, just one more comment. If you want to try this at home, which you actually can do. Um, on the handout that was at the back, there's a brief exercise, um, which involves trying to have a different sort of political conversation with somebody you know. And if you decide to try it, try it the first time with someone who you think is a relatively reasonable person. <laughs> Don't go for your crotchety you know, pervasively obnoxious Uncle Max <laughs> who's never agreed with anything you say. But give it a go and, and pay attention to what it feels like to you to have a different sort of political conversation. So thanks everybody and Michelle? Yes, sir. All right, well thank you all so much yeah. for your presentations. Those are awesome. Yeah. Um, Maybe I'll just set this down. Uh, now uh, we're going to proceed to questions. If anybody has a question um, that has not been picked up yet, feel free to ask for a card or lift up your card uh, and let these wonderful ladies know you've got something and they will bring it up to me. Um, so the first question is for the Better Angels team. Um, question is, could you give us an idea of the process of the workshops in exchange of views? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll give you a short idea. It's, it, the, the workshops, um, depending on whether they're a half day or a full day, um, consist of a few exercises. In the first one, the groups are split into red-blue groups, each with a moder moderator, and um, they are asked to uh, list 
stereotypes that they think the other group has of them. And then they're asked to state what they think is wrong about those stereotypes. And then they're asked to say, what is the kernel of truth in those stereotypes? So um, they are asked, everyone in the workshop is asked to do some degree of self-examination. And they're pushed a little bit by the moderators to do that. That's reported out to the group. Um, the second exercise is what's called a fishbowl exercise. And um, in a fishbowl exercise, one group sits in the middle, and the other people sit around the sides and don't speak. The people in the center um, are asked to address uh, a couple of questions, why they think that the policies of their particular group are better for the country, and then um, what problems or issues they think there are with the policies in their group. So the same process of stating what you believe, but also trying to look critically at what you believe. Um, in the afternoon section, there is um, an opportunity in a full day workshop for each group to pose certain questions to the other side that they would like to get answered. And the, the, the key point about this in, for a better angels workshop is they're not gotcha questions, okay? They're not like, how could you possibly vote for so-and-so <laughs> when you say that you're a feminist? <laughs> they are questions of, to attempt to get clarification and understanding of what the other side believes and what the other side thinks should be done, okay? Um, and then I think there is a fourth one which I'm blocking on at the moment. <laughs> and then we wrap up the, the full day workshop with an opportunity for people to say what they got out of it um, and also to try to look at um, some action strategies, things that they think could happen or should happen. Is that That's right? Nice. Okay, and this, the skills workshop is a little different and, and is structured really in very kind of um, classic communication skills ways with attempts, with, with uh, time to practice these in the workshop. I'm happy to, if somebody has questions after, I'm happy to give you some more information. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, next question. Um, much of our communication uh, with people who have opposing views happens online. Um, how do we or can we apply these principles in that environment? <laughs> this sounds like a Dr. Lynn question. Oh. Yes. Um, actually, this, these experiments, these series of experiments were all conducted online. Um, so in Twitter debates, you might have fewer words you can um, craft these arguments with. But it is very, it is largely the same kind of idea online. Um, and I think those interactions are really important online. You can, um, again, I think uh, what you said was very reasonable. Don't go for the ones that are not, you know, an ounce. Uh, go for, uh, be in a discussion with someone that's reasonable, right? You can start there and start by kind of seeing their point of view, right? And then proposing your own. But also while you're, because I think at the end of the day, we are going to be talking about policy issues, discussing policy issues, and you want them to maybe see eye to eye with you. So a good way is to draw some of their values in while trying to convince them why you, for example, why universal health care might be good or why increased military spending might be important. So I think an online platform is actually a very important place where these exchanges should be occurring. All right, and just as a corollary to that, we have a card here, more of a comment than a question, but it asks if any of the panelists are familiar with a similar online media forum called Spaceship Media. Uh, the conduct facilitated online uh, forums across political divides. Does anybody? I don't know. I'm not familiar with that particular one. There are several other organizations that try to foster communication among uh, uh, different political uh, groups. Um, one of them, I think, is called Living Room, um, and they. Some of them are done uh, online. Some of them are done by um, online chat, uh, you know, video, skyping kind of forum. Um, the 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 thing that we feel in Better Angels that's different about that is that there are some risks when you have very unstructured conversations of people uh, getting attacked. Um, being vilified or demonized in the course of a conversation. And we also feel that the shared 
red-blue equality of leadership is really important. And that's not something that, that particularly happens in most of these other organizations. But there are some other fora that are, are working in this arena. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, divisions are not always liberal versus conservative, uh, but can be very significant. Uh, can these same techniques uh, be applied to such situations? Sorry, I didn't Oh, I'm sorry. Um, basically, it's saying that, uh, you know, political divisions not always liberal versus conservative, um, but these different types of political divisions can be but very significant. But maybe generational, for example. Right. Yeah. So uh, can these same techniques be applied to such situations? I have something on that, and I got to thinking about it with the controversy of Colin Kaepernick taking a knee for the national anthem. And I thought about how my dad and his brothers and cousins were raised, and how I was raised. So if he grew up, he was born in the 20s, his first duty was to get his family through the depression as, you know, an eight-year-old picking lettuce. As soon as he got finished with that, he went to World War II, and then he spent the rest of his life raising his family and doing everything he was supposed to do. I, on the other hand, was, well, still am, a baby boomer, and I spent my days at Washington and Cruzy Park playing ball. So if he would have gone, if I would have gone to him and said, Colin Kaepernick has freedom, and he has freedom of speech, that would go right past him. He'd agree with that, but he, he is a, he, my dad would be from the category of duty and honor. And I'm of the category of freedom because I grew up and I had all the freedom I wanted and he had all the duty you can imagine, um, just the way he was raised. And it wasn't a bad, well, it was, a, it was a hardship, but he never would consider going to his dad and asking his dad for more freedom <laughs> because that would not have gone well. So it's sort of like what you were talking about framing the argument. If I went to him and came up with a reason that Cal Colin Kaepernick could take a knee that had to do with honor, he might listen to me. Mm -hmm. And if, he, if my dad came to me and said he shouldn't do it, he shouldn't be able to take a knee, and my dad framed it around freedom, I would probably listen to that better. It's mm -hmm. just based, I think our beliefs are based on experiences and perspective, and it may not be malice, it's just how, we, how I was raised compared to how my dad was raised. I think in terms of the kind of um, techniques and strategies that Better Angels supports and uses, you can <coughs> apply those forms of communication to pretty much any debate where people have very strongly held opinions on opposing sides. Because essentially you're talking about wanting to listen to the other person in a respectful way and to hear what they have to say and to present your own views in a, a, a firmly held way, not giving up your own views at all, but again in a respectful way. And I think you could probably use that in pretty much any situation where there's a difference of opinion. This is also kind of a generational response, I thought. Um, so your example was fantastic. Um, I also want to bring up the example of kind of like bridging the generation divide because it, it's not always about liberal or conservative. Sometimes it is a generational thing. Um, when Black Lives Matter was happening, there was a campaign going on that I was part of in the Bay Area called um, Letters for Black Lives. Um, it originated actually out in the east, uh, out in New York City, 
and it kind of spun two different cities and different cities had different organizers. And the point of that was kind of these Asian American communities starting to kind of, it troubled me greatly that like our grand, like my grandparents don't really care about these issues of like other communities that are not their own, right? Because, you know, as immigrants, they might be like, oh, we're okay now. We seem good as a community. We don't care about any other community. So that troubled me a lot. So this campaign and a lot of other kind of immigrant second generation um, kids or the young professionals started this campaign that was just a letter. This letter was addressed to your grandparents, aunts, and uncles, and it, it told the story of why we should start caring about communities that are not our own. Um, this then got translated from Chinese to Thai to different Indian languages, um, then incorporated Latinx communities and beyond. So I, I think that was kind of one way we wanted to be able to appeal to like our grandparents or our older aunts and uncles to also let them understand why these issues are important to us. And even though they feel like they're not part of it, that they, they can be and they can understand it in a different way. So this next question is specifically for, for Professor Taylor. Um, this person is asking, uh, the Civil War was never resolved and involved blood and death. Do you see a better outcome this time around? <laughs> if so, how, how do we get there? Well, um, <laughs> you know, th th it's interesting because throughout the 80s, there were people like Ellis Coase with a C who wrote, about the coming race war, and the rest of us did not take them seriously. Um, because we just can't imagine that things would spin so out of control, and I still think it won't. I just think America physically, geographically, is just too large a country to all be on. We have 320 people, million people here legally, and I just don't think we can all get on a page, on the same page about any one thing, even civil war. Um, in fact, our partisan division will keep us from civil war. <laughs> we won't agree to, uh, to that. But I do think the polarization is thick and real. And that's why I think uh, leadership is really important uh, to help navigate these times. I mean, we're talking about tremendous ge geographic and demographic changes. Um, the last three uh, generations of African Americans are moving back south. Baby boomers, uh, Xers, and millennials. The black population is going from 44 million now to 75 million by 2055. Yeah. We're talking 35 years from now. The entire national population goes to 400 million. Every group in America grows except the dominant group in terms of exponential growth in population. Right? And then we're talking about the opioid crisis that intensifies it in unpredict unexpected ways. That's a whole nother emergency. And so the, it's, it, it, there's a reason and a legitimate cause for anxiety, especially in the dominant group. These numbers are changing. For me, it's where leadership has to take a, 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 a step forward and help us, as you all are trying to do, uh, find ways to negotiate and navigate these changes, but they are inevitable. I think the only reference we might have, the only group that can sort of teach us is maybe the Native Americans at some point when the white population reaches a tipping point and becomes the majority here, and they all of a sudden are like, oh man, we're not the majority anymore in, in our country. And it's like the, the massive psychological effect that must have had on Native Americans when the census said, you are now a minority. And I think we're going through something similar over the next 20 to 40, I'm sorry, the next 20 to 50 years. And unfortunate for us, just like in the Civil War, to go back to it, you know, the political gods gave us Andrew Johnson to be the vice president of Abraham Lincoln rather than Lyndon Baines Johnson. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, if, 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 God, if the political gods liked us, they would have given us Lyndon Baines Johnson to be the success of Abraham Lincoln, and we could have avoided all of this, I, I presume. But on, on, you know, on a serious level, um, you know, uh, parties play an important role in our divisions. And that's something we aren't talking about. We think the parties reflect the division. But I wonder to what extent the parties actually reinforce and nurture the division for political gain. And please keep in mind the framers did not codify political parties in the framework and political system of the United States of America from the founding. They were suspicious of them, they weren't interested in them, 
Um, Jefferson eventually, the Democrat Republicans emerge, and then the Republicans emerge, and then we end up after Abraham Lincoln with a two-party system of two parties. So one solution, and this is uh, impractical, is to abolish the parties. That's not going to happen. The other solution that might be more practical, this goes back to my localism statement, is to create more parties. We need more parties is the solution to our political divisions. We need five parties, like in England or in Israel. You know, you need several parties. So then we can divide a lot of these continuum, a lot of these divisions that seem binary are way more nuanced if you have alternatives. So black politics in the Democratic Party, I constantly remind people, are bound by a politics of limited options. So we end up, okay, you all are on this side, then we're going on that side. When blacks were Republicans, and then there was a pivot in 1932, all of a sudden, the, there was a complete turnover of the party system, right? Blacks become Democrats. And I'm sure, you know, somebody in the, in the 1900s, waking up in the 1960s, looking at blacks aligning themselves with the, Repub with the Democrats have to be shocked from 100 years ago because the nature of our binary politics allows the two most contended, uh, contested groups, pretty much the element that they call the Reagan Democrats and the African American Democrats, um, that's the, those two have been the major balance of power groups. Either of those groups can have the, you know, the, 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 be the determining vote uh, 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 factor. And I argue, and I said this on all of the news media, I've said it in public places and I'll say it right now, that I don't really buy into the notion that Donald Trump has his own base. I think the media has created the fiction that Donald Trump has a base. I think it's nonsense. Donald, if Donald Trump had a base, how did he lose by three million votes on the day of the election and has not won an election since? Donald Trump lost last November by eight million votes. 11 million votes cast so far, three times. Doug Jones, Donald Trump lost. I'm not saying that there aren't instances where he won. I'm just saying overall, 100 million people stayed home in, in 16, so that should give you some reason to um, have hope that we haven't all of a sudden turned right and become this fascist country. A lot of people were apathetic and we should be talking about them. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, uh, so they, they, they need to be held out, uh, up. Then the 60 plus million that did not vote, um, I think indicates that America is, in other words, I think if we all turned our televisions off and closed our computers, you would hardly know you had political divisions in America. In terms of how we're being cued to, you know, Fox or MSNBC or CNN, they're sending us cues constantly. The parties are constantly sending us cues to keep us divided. And the framers did not include parties because they were potentially divisive. And so uh, our part, our political system has been captured by this alien phenomenon that the framers never intended to be a part of our system. We were not supposed to have Democrats and Republicans. And now that we do. We do, but we need to recognize that philosophically the framers were not uh, interested in them because they did not see the value of them in terms of the, the, the legal aspect of our constitution, uh, it, maybe the political part. So I would just say that um, uh, uh, the parties polarize, um, and they don't just reflect our polarization, they, they nurture it. And again, abolish the parties or have many, many parties, local parties, I think for example, with, if you think of Elihu Harris, the former mayor of San Francisco, uh, Oakland, he made the mistake, if you remember, of racistly uh, or, or stereotypically using these food elements that he used in East Oakland um, as a campaign rally and it backfired. And black Democrats from East Oakland voted for Audie Bach. Anybody remember Audie Bach? Yeah. Right? She beat Elihu Harris. I think she was Green Party, wasn't she? Green. Yeah. Matt Gonzalez against Gavin Newsom. If he really wanted to be mayor that second time, he could have he, he, he could have challenged Newsom. So there's some reason to believe that local the, the, the lo local solutions. I think local politics is the solution to our national division. Let's get together locally, like the League of Women Voters are, are doing here under your leadership right now. That's what we need to be doing, having these kind of conversations right here and the kinds of workshops that you're you're, you're presenting. Um, uh, 
And, and that's it. I think, you know, we have to realize that we have structural issues that cause our divisions. We only have two parties and that feeds it. If we had multiple parties, it's not to say we wouldn't have, uh, you know, bi binary, it's not to say we won't have divisions, but they would not be as binary and so easily to mani manipulate around things like race or, <coughs> or um, let's say income or, or ideas about foreign policy. There would be way more nuance if we had middling parties. That's what uh, Aristotle said, right? Many heads are better than one, and he advocated the notion of a middling constitution, right, for moderation. But right now we have red versus blue, one party eating off the red, one party parasitically living off the blue, blacks 95% solidly supporting Democrats for the past 60 years, um, you know, and it has not produced a transformative um, outcome in their, in their politics. Um, and so it's um, a real, I think, you know, issue. Um, uh, the Civil War did not resolve, the Civil Wars, the Civil War um, was, you know, again, I'm not a Civil War historian, but it seems to me that the cultural aspects of the Civil War, um, the attempt was to reconcile the nation. Uh, Barrington Moore talks about this in his book, The Origins of uh, Dictatorship, Democracy, um, and how to reconcile but it seems like the Civil War issues were never really uh, resolved. What we did was sort of come up with 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment solutions, um, but the divisions were still there. We never had, uh, uh, in my view, the kind of reconciliation that was needed. Of course, the Gettysburg Address uh, is very powerful. Lincoln's word, Lincoln himself is very powerful. And if you, if you remember Robert Bella, who was over at Berkeley, he talks about civil religion, and he talks about Abraham Lincoln is America's messianic Christ figure who, was, who comes out of nowhere in 1856, becomes president, is killed in you know, a short, less than five year period of time, like the Christ figure shows up out of nowhere after his childhood pops up, and then boom, he's dead, right? And so, and so uh, Robert Bella made this analogy that Abraham Lincoln's blood was messianically spilled for America and that Abraham Lincoln is the high point of America. Uh, so I go back to my original point that leadership, I honestly, I'm not deeply religious at all, but I think spiritual leadership is what is needed in this country. And I don't mean it in a religious sense, I mean it in the sense that we need people who help us see that we have, like Maya Angelou said, we, have, we are more alike than unalike. The language, we need the language, because part of what you all are dealing with is the language. I mean, think about the language of your father and you trying to talk about this. It's, uh, many of these things you're measuring are, if I say something to you, if you're conservative, and I, if, I say, if I use the right language, you might be more receptive, right? And, and if I don't accuse you of this or that, um, then maybe you'll be open to hearing me, right? So I think we as a people have to realize um, that, the dem I, I just think many Americans, uh, especially people in times like these, they see big developments and they're quick to say things like, uh, you know, we're turning into a fascist country and this autocratic country. And I'm like, but what about your faith in the democracy? I, I have faith in, in the, uh, the democracy and, and I just believe that when all of this is said and done, the, the common sense wisdom of America will prevail. And I hate to run out on you all, but I've been itching all night because I have another event that I need to go to with Keith Carson and a bunch of people waiting for me to come and speak right now. And I've been trying to stay here patiently as long as I could, but I have to run to a, a second event right now. So thank you all for your time. I left my business cards here. If anybody wants it, uh, you can email me. I'll be glad to talk to you some more. Thank you all for having me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now I gotta run through the tube. Speed Good luck in the tube. Any police here that can give me an escort? Good night, everybody. Take care. Okay. Um, so uh, we've got a statement and a question. Um, statement. I do believe that one-on-one -on -one discussions work is demonstrated. I see a greater problem with political leaders who do not interact with each other on a one-to-one -one level. Uh, Congress people used to live near each other and interact. It doesn't happen anymore. And then the question, has Better Angels approached congressional leadership to do workshops in D.C.? <laughs> 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 we, we actually have not approached congressional leadership at this point, but um, we have, the, the national organization has worked with uh, the, the um, 
the house in, I believe it is Minnesota, um, and they have been holding workshops with uh, mostly skills kind of workshops, like sort of communication training sort of workshops with members of the House of Representatives in, um, I think it's Minnesota, forgive me, um, that I think have, they have found pretty productive. So there, that is a, a growing area of, um, that, that, they're try, that the national organization is trying to develop. We haven't tried tackling Congress yet, and that's a little bit. I've got something. Yes, go for it. Yeah. I agreed with 100% with Dr. Taylor when he talked about the parties egging us on. Uh, I believe it's all about us. And if you turn on whatever news you watch, it, it seems to be the job of our leaders to build as much polarization as they can. And it's not, it's all sides. Uh, and we have our community, we have our common ground. And I think if we take that with a grain of salt, what they're saying to us, and we go ahead and we vote our conscience every June or every November, uh, but just remember that we're the ones that need to get along. I think that's the way to go, rather than taking the red meat and the bait. Do you have anything? All right, final question of the night. Um, kind of question and comment. I fear our echo chambers are worse than ever before with the rise of social media and websites with questionable integrity. Media is full of talking heads parading opinion as fact rather than laying out the facts and letting the public decide. With all of this influence, are we at the point that we can no longer move the political needle on a macro level it seems the three branches of government are a mess where nothing positive can move forward. Are we at the point where we just have to focus on what we can do in local communities? Um, who would like to take that one on? Okay. I really have fun with social media. And I'm on Facebook. Um, I do Facebook Live once in a while. But it is absolutely impossible to win a political argument on social media because there is just, any time you do something that way or texting, even when you're texting for business, the context isn't there. And it, it, it there's a, the president of Drexel University, his name is John Fry, and he wrote an article about a year ago that empathy and respect come from talking one-on-one, -on -one, spending less time on social media and talking one-on-one, -on -one. and he wrote a great article on that. And all you, if you Google John Frey, or John Fry, F-R-E-Y, uh, on finding common ground, he just, it, it's a great article on communication. Uh, there was more to that question, though. And I don't know if I can handle it. <laughs> just set it down. Um, I think it was, um, start locally? Yeah, starting locally. And uh, are we just at the point where we just have to focus on what we can do in local communities? I think so. I will tell you about one conversation at the uh, workshop that Joe Leslie and I did. We had four people that identified themselves as capitalists. Three of them went on the conservative side and one of them went on the liberal or progressive side. Three of them, or two of them called themselves libertarian, two of them called themselves liberal, and two of them called themselves conservative. One of them voted for Hillary, two of them voted for Trump, and one of them voted for the libertarian candidate for president. So on the local level, we all have our political views and our political leanings, but it's just impossible to, like I said, buttonhole us to one set of, you know, whatever the Republican platform is going to be or whatever the Democratic platform is going to be. Every view they had was nuanced, whether it was on the environment or whether it was on property rights or whatever it was. They all identified themselves as capitalists, but they were all at a totally different place on the political spectrum. 
Oh, you go. Oh. Um, I think, and, and this isn't, I'm not speaking as a representative of Better Angels at this point, but um, I think that it's really only at a local level that you can find common ground with people of different political persuasions about issues in your community that you really feel need addressing and you actually can find ways to um, utilize the skills and perspective of everybody who's involved. So I do actually think that a lot of activity now needs to be local and I think that local, um, local <coughs> politics does gradually build into state, you know, city politics, state politics, and eventually national politics. So. Well, back to the online algorithms part real quick. Um, I think there, there, that is true. It is the algorithms are creating these echo chambers because you keep liking types of posts and they only show you the posts that you tend to like, right? So you tend to only read the same things over and over again. This is very different from the past when you go to a newsstand and then like 10 different types of paper with different headlines are out there and you're just skimming them all, right? This is now just a homepage with certain things coming up on your newsfeed. My um, kind of personally, what I do is I follow both people from both parties, uh, people that I find reasonable. I follow news sources that I also view as um, fair and balanced coverage, and you can find a lot of, um, if you, I think, if you Google media polarization chart, there's a kind of an axis of different medias plotted on it, and like skewing way conservative, conservative, way liberal, but a lot of good sources in the middle that uh, focus on economic policy, slightly conservative, but very well thought out arguments and things like that. So that's how I learned the most about um, the other side, or maybe policies I don't necessarily agree with, but it's really nice to read good, fair coverage of that and uh, for understanding. So the more you follow those people and those sources, the more balanced your newsfeed will also become because of the algorithms. Um, the second part is always start from the local communities. The Bay Area, I'm originally from Illinois. I moved here from Chicago six years ago, so I'm not a native here. But California is just like rich with social movements, community organizing, like compared to other states, like this is such a special area. And um, my, my students, they read a lot of things that I, that I assign them that are about local communities fighting back against policies that are unfair to them, right? There's a book called um, Refinery Town about Richmond and how they fought back about uh, against the oil refineries. There's a lot of good articles about uh, basically um, neighborhood associations and the mission fighting gentrification for a long time. Um, these are just really great examples of how communities can fight against city level politics even. And then again, that branches out. Another thing I wanted to bring up is, um, for example, at the national level, we might, as a, as a country, we might not, not sign on to some environmental agreements or pollution emission standards that internationally other countries might be a part of. But a lot of cities in different countries and also in the states can take up these local green initiatives, right? So a lot of these things can start locally, start from the city level and actually do a very good job. Well, that concludes our questions. And I wanna thank everybody for participating and coming out tonight and uh, especially uh, thank our panelists, uh, Professor Taylor, Dr. Lynn, uh, Steve, and Leslie. Thank you so much for coming out uh, and talking about this important topic. And just one last plug for information on future forums. You can join the League of Women Voters uh, of Alameda. You can sign up for our e-blasts, or you can check out the calendar on our website, lwvalameda.org.